Welcome back to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We have now completed our introduction with all its five chapters and moving on to the Yoga of the Divine Works. This is our episode number 33. And this chapter, this part, has many chapters, and the very first chapter is called The Four aids what supports us in this journey of our inner transformation let me read the lines and for those who are new you will find a link below in the description to this book and this specific chapter called the the four aids it will be very good if you follow the text that I'm reading so that we can travel together, enjoy the journey together. So check the link below. <clears throat> yoga Siddhi, the perfection that comes from the practice of yoga, can be best attained by the combined working of four great instruments. Yoga Siddhi. Siddhi is perfection. And in yoga, we are looking at two major groupings of Siddhi. One is the normal human nature and its perfection. Other is a divine possibilities lying dormant in human nature, awakening and bringing out that faculties that appear to our human nature divine in its efflorescence, the way it functions. So there is a human perfection and divine perfection. First, we need to develop our human perfection and it is upon that foundation the divine perfection can come. So Yoga Siddhi, the perfection that comes from the practice of yoga, can be best attained by the combined workings of four great instruments. There are four great instruments. He will be elaborating them. And there is a combined working of these four instruments. There is first the knowledge of the truths, principles, powers and processes that govern the realization. Shastra. Shastra is a Sanskrit term which can be applied to knowledge as well as science. It is the science of yoga and it has its Shastra and its body of knowledge that gives truths, principles, powers and processes. So there is, if you take any practice, you will find there is a process that you need to follow, whether it is meditation or any type of like so-called Kriya. Kriya is a process. So behind that process is power, whether it is power of the mind, power of the heart, powers of the body, or the deeper aspects of powers. So there is a process, and behind the process there are powers, and behind powers there are principles that govern the powers and the truth of existence that is expressing itself through this. So there is a need for right knowledge. So there is first the knowledge of the truths, principles, powers and processes that govern the realization, Shastra. If we are to realize our perfection, whatever be the domain, whether it is perfection of the mind, perfection of the life energy, perfection of the body, there is a corresponding knowledge. If body is to be perfected, then there is a process that is corresponding to the body's perfection and its powers corresponding to the body and the principles corresponding to the body and the truths corresponding to the body. So that all that can be applied to bring the realization to the level of body and the same thing can be applied at the level of our vitality and our mind. Every level there comes this corresponding knowledge, the Shastra, 
for each layer and the overall Shastra. So there is first the knowledge of the truths, principles, powers and processes that govern the realization Shastra. Next comes a patient and persistent action on the lines laid down by this knowledge. The force of our personal effort, Utsaha. Utsaha is a Sanskrit word for that personal effort, an enthusiastic effort, joyful effort for the realization. So on one hand, we have knowledge. Knowledge is not enough. There is the effort that is required. Often what happens to people is that the knowledge itself is so enjoyable, particularly the vast philosophy. You settle with knowledge itself and do not get into the actual effort that is required in real transformation and the realization. So initially we are not even aware of this dimension. We are the very joy of discovering the knowledge. That itself will bring some changes, but that enthusiastic effort in transforming ourselves come after some time when the knowledge settles and you get clarity on which direction to go. Then comes the enthusiastic effort to make the difference in our daily life. So that's where the patient and persistent action on the lines laid down by this knowledge, the force of our personal effort, Utsaha. There intervenes third, uplifting our knowledge and effort into the domain of spiritual experience, the direct suggestion example and influence of the teacher, Guru. Guru is the third instrument in the journey. So we have Shastra, then we have Utsaha, now there is a Guru, the teacher, who brings the direct suggestion and example, which leads to real spiritual experiences. So that's the third, the uplifting our knowledge and effort into the domain of spiritual experience. So initially we have the knowledge that is gathered, then we bring our effort, and these are to be uplifted into the domain of actual spiritual experience. In that space comes the role of the teacher, who by one's own direct suggestion or example and influence, who infuses and lifts up the seeker to the domain of experience. That's the third. And the fourth, last comes the instrumentality of time, kāda. For in all things there is a cycle of their action and a period of the divine movement. So we have shastra, we have utsaha, guru and kāda. These are the four instruments. Kāda is the time. And everything has its time. If you plant a seed, there's a time cycle for a plant. It has to grow, it has to mature before it can bloom. And there's a time involved in it. So there is time cycle, life cycle of everything. There is a period of movement, of the divine movement. For each individual who is an evolving soul, there is certain time cycle for the development of the inner faculties and their blooming. So one must have the patience to go through that cycle. So different people have different time cycles. So there will be a difference according to the individual and their preparedness in the journey, how far the evolution has come, how far you have reached. Accordingly, the blooming happens. So the last comes the instrumentality of time, kāda. For in all things, there is a cycle of their action and a period of the divine movement. Now, Sharanda moves on to the first instrument, which is Shastra. What is the, the right knowledge? What is the Shastra of yoga, particularly integral yoga? And remember, this whole part of synthesis of yoga, he has taken up the yoga of divine works. How? Through work, we can unite with the divine. And there's a reason why he starts with works itself, because that's 
where integral yoga is one with work yoga of divine works come nearest to the integral yoga the supreme shastra of the integral yoga is the eternal veda secret in the heart of every thinking and living being eternal veda supreme shastra shastra as we know is the knowledge or body of knowledge science of yoga and there are many different pathways and very different bodies of knowledge but here he is referring to the supreme shastra the ultimate what is that supreme shastra it is the eternal veda secret in the heart of every thinking and living being normally when we hear the word veda we associate it with a set of ancient scriptures particularly the four scriptures we have inherited the rig veda sama veda yajur veda atharva veda these are the four inherited compilations of the ancient wisdom that is not what sri aurobindo is referring here he is referring to the eternal veda secret in the heart of every thinking and living being thinking and living being we the humans are thinking creatures mental beings we are not just living beings we are also thinking beings the power of thought and the creative word that unfolds through us and the ancient compilation called the vedas are the discoveries by the ancient rishis going deep within themselves and they gave articulation corresponding to that period of human history so that is the veda of that time and that vedic knowledge lost in the long long cycles of time and again recovered and given new form again recovered and given new form so we will see in the long history of india the knowledge getting recovered and given new form every time a new cycle begins it is given a new form essential way the secret is deep within human nature and that's eternal but the form with which it finds its expression changes So Sri Aurobindo is pointing at the supreme shastra the ultimate science and body of knowledge is to be found within ourselves deep within it is it is something eternal So the supreme shastra of the integral yoga is the eternal veda secret in the heart it is secret in the heart of every thinking and living being the lotus of the eternal knowledge and the eternal perfection is a bud closed and folded up within us there is eternal knowledge and eternal perfection there is something deep within us which is already perfect but our outer nature is imperfect and it is also that which has the eternal knowledge and it is a bud that is closed and folded up within us and it is that which is gradually unfolded through the process of yoga it is already there within us but it is not manifest in our daily life and we are not connected with it it has to be reconnected and brought out and expressed in life that which already exists within us so the lotus of eternal knowledge and the eternal perfection is a bud closed and folded up within us it opens swiftly or gradually petal by petal through successive realizations once the mind of man begins to turn towards the eternal once his heart no longer compressed and confined by attachment to the finite appearances 
becomes enamored in whatever degree of the infinite. So this bud within us will unfold progressively, gradually, petal by petal. Through successive realizations, our inner realization is successive. In the Vedas, they would refer to the succession of the dawns. Our inner awakening comes in succession of dawns. The light bursts out in waves. And there is a wave of realization that comes and settles and prepares the instrument for the next wave to arise, to, for the next wave. It is a succession of wave after wave of awakening, taking us forward in this evolutionary journey. So it opens swiftly or gradually. It can also open swiftly in some people. For some, it is very slow, gradual process, petal by petal, through successive realizations. Once the, man, once the mind of man begins to turn towards the eternal, our mind must turn towards the eternal. There is eternal and transient. Our mind is normally caught up in the transient with our little life, with our little life events with its attachments, with its attractions, repulsions, its tiny little goals. That's where the mind is absorbed. Then gradually we wake up wondering, what am I doing with my life? What is the purpose of life? What is it that would last? What is that which is eternal? Because nothing in our life lasts. Everything perishes. Everything decays, disintegrates, degenerates and goes away. Everything is bound by death, bound by ignorance. And out of that process, we gradually wake up and turn the mind towards that which is eternal. When, once the mind of man begins to turn towards the eternal, once his heart, again, not just the mind that turns towards the eternal, but heart as well, once his heart no longer compressed and confined by attachments to finite appearances. Compressed and confined. Our heart has the tendency to get attached to what it loves. In that process, it gets confined and also compressed into narrow moles of life where it is attached and bound and we are bound to finite appearances of the infinite. We are not aware of the infinity at all. We are familiar with the finite forms of life. We ourselves have a very finite life, finite capacities, and everything is very, very limited. Within that tiny little limited life, we get attached to our relationships, our house, our profession, our objects that are around because they have become so familiar, your identity gets molded around it and you get confined in it, compressed into it and heart is bound within that limit. Only when heart wakes up and turns towards the eternal. So once his heart no longer compressed and confined by attachment to finite appearances, becomes enamored in whatever degree of the infinite. So that whole covering with this attachment to the finite has to be gradually opened up. It's like that normal state is like living within a cocoon, the larva living within the cocoon. It is not yet the butterfly, but it lives within that confined, compressed, limited life. That's our ordinary life. But there is a potential to become that beautiful butterfly. But heart, by its very nature, when it is in this life, binds itself to finite forms. And 
gradually when we wake up and we get drawn to the infinity, drawn to the eternal. So this inner bud, it opens swiftly or gradually, petal by petal. Through successive realizations, once the mind of man begins to turn towards the eternal, once his heart, no longer compressed and confined by attachments, attachment to finite appearances, becomes enamored in whatever degree of the infinite. All life, all thought, all energizing of the faculties, all experiences, passive or active, becomes thenceforward so many shocks which disintegrate the teguments of the soul and remove the obstacles to the inevitable efflorescence. Very interesting line here. Shocks which disintegrates. All life, all thought, all energizing of the faculties. Remember, very first chapter of introduction, Sri ends with the line, all life is yoga. Then he extended it in the coming chapters as all life is yoga of nature. And further he extends it saying all life is yoga of nature to realize the divine, unveil the divine in the manifest world. So there is a yoga of nature that is going on. All life is yoga. And we go through shocks of life. And these shocks are shaking us to disintegrate, to break apart the shell, the coverings that binds us into the finite, where we are bound within the finite. So these are like many shocks which disintegrate the tegumens of the soul. The soul is like wrapped in a cover which has to be broken and remove the obstacles to the inevitable efflorescence. Whatever be the obstacle to the efflorescence, the flowering of the soul, it is to be removed. So there is the whole life itself and the events of life that is shaping us. All life, all thought, all energizing of faculties, all our thoughts and energizing of the faculties, whether it is faculty of thought, faculty of emotions, will, senses, body itself, all that energizing that we do. All life, all thought, all energizing of the faculties, all experiences, passive or active, all experiences of life, whether it is happening passively or we seek after them actively, become thenceforward so many shocks which disintegrate the tegumens of the soul and remove the obstacles to the inevitable efflorescence. He who chooses the infinite has been chosen by the infinite. This is a very well known, widely quoted line from Sri Aurobindo. He who chooses the infinite has been chosen by the infinite. When we turn towards yoga, we are not aware that it is the great wisdom of the infinite, the divine wisdom that is nudging us to turn towards yoga. We are not aware because we are attached to our tiny little life and its bondage. And it is within that window we are looking at things. And we also believe that it is we ourselves who are seeking and turning towards yoga, which is not true. The deeper truth is, the greater wisdom presiding over your evolution is gently bringing the shocks of life to break the shells so that you gently wake up and your mind and heart turns towards the infinite, the eternal. He has received the divine touch without which there is no awakening, no opening of the spirit. But once it is received, attainment is sure, whether conquered swiftly in the course of one human life or pursued patiently through many stadia of the cycle of existence in the manifested universe. 
he has received the divine touch so it is a continuation from the previous line there is a divine touch that is the reason why we are waking up without that touch there is no awakening possible no awakening no opening of the heart but once it is received that is the touch is received the attainment is sure because it is not your limited capacity that would leads to attainment but the divine wisdom that is already working and shaping you that knows how to take you towards the goal so the touch is there that's the reason why you are waking up and say becoming a seeker so whether conquered swiftly in the course of one human life or pursued patiently through many stadia of the cycles of existence in the manifested universe so this journey can take one life or many lives in this manifested world but attainment is absolutely certain because you have been chosen by the infinite and that's the most amazing thing about integral yoga to recognize this that you have been chosen by a great wisdom and your real work is to recognize its workings through you how it is guiding how it is leading that's the most important part of integral yoga because the one who has chosen the infinite is chosen by the infinite nothing can be taught to the mind which is not already concealed as potential knowledge in the unfolding soul of the creature nothing can be taught to the mind which is not already concealed as potential knowledge in the unfolding soul of the creature so here we have to distinguish between the soul and the mind mind is the outer instrumentation soul contains all the potential knowledge not just of this life of all the past evolution your evolutionary journey everything is contained within the soul but the mind is unaware it is caught in the externalities absorbed and lost in it and here sri arvind is bringing in this picture that nothing can be taught to the mind which is not already contained within the soul of the creature that which we are seeking is already there within us whether it is knowledge or the realization that we are seeking it is already there within us but the mind is turned outwardly so it cannot know and mind would learn rapidly when that which is already concealed in the mind in the soul is gently brought forth that's what makes the learning of the mind extremely effective fast and also this very powerful statement nothing can be taught to the mind you cannot teach anything to the mind if it is not already there inside the person nothing can be taught to the mind which is not already concealed as a potential knowledge it is a potentiality not yet a manifest form it is a potentiality soul has infinite potentiality out of that potentiality certain things emerge and take shape in the mind and for the mind to learn it has to turn towards that and open to the influence of the soul so nothing can be taught to the mind which is not already concealed as potential knowledge in the unfolding soul of the creature so also all perfection of which the outer man is capable is only a realizing of the eternal perfection of the spirit within him this point we have already touched not only knowledge but the perfection that we are seeking is already contained within the soul as a potentiality that can be brought forth so it's an unveiling of it or perfection of which the outer man is capable the outer man there is a inner man and the outer man we have our outer being and the inner being it is the outer being that is caught in this limited narrow life body mind construct this is capable of perfection but that perfection 
is coming from the perfection that is already contained as a potentiality within the soul. It is to be brought into the outer man, into the outer layers of our instrumental nature. Mental nature, vital nature, physical nature. And they eventually open to that possibility of perfection which is contained in the soul. So also, all perfection of which the outer man is capable is only a realizing of the eternal perfection of the spirit within. We know the divine and become the divine because we are that already in our secret nature. We know the divine and become the divine. One is to know, other is to become. Become is preceded, preceded by knowing first. Through the knowing, through growing identification with that infinity, eternity, we discover our divine possibilities. We become the divine. That is the only way to know the divine, by becoming the divine. We know the divine and become the divine because we are that already in our secret nature, in our very deepest depth. We are already that. But the outer being is separated, disconnected and no more remembers our true nature. Therefore, we suffer. The root cause of suffering is this deep sense of separation and imitation. And that is illusion. That is the Maya part. We know the divine and become the divine because we are that already in our secret nature. All teaching is a revealing. All becoming is an unfolding. Beautiful, powerful statement. All teaching is a revealing. Revealing means something that is already contained. It is revealed, unveiled, little by little. It is already there, just getting revealed. All teaching is a revealing. So teaching is not something that is put from outside into the learner. Learner already contains, carries within the thing to be known. It has to be revealed to the learner. So the teacher's role is to reveal. All teaching is a revealing. All becoming is an unfolding. Become in time and space. Be manifest, which is essentially an unfolding. Like a bud would unfold and become this beautiful large flower. Otherwise, everything is compacted into the tiny little bud or a whole tree is compacted into a tiny little seed and it unfolds in time and space. So, the soul carries this potentiality which finds its unfoldment in time and space when we open to yoga. Our divine possibilities can unfold petal by petal branch by branch to become the mighty tree. All that possibility is there. Self-attainment is the secret. Self-knowledge and an ever and an increasing consciousness are the means and the process. Self-attainment, attaining that eternal timeless self is the secret. Self-knowledge and an increasing consciousness Self-knowledge, knowing this within ourselves. We know ourselves as that, little by little. Self-knowledge and an increasing consciousness. Our being, inner being expands and enlarges as we open to its influence. Outer being breaks its limitations as the inner being emerges. So the self-knowledge and an increasing consciousness are the means and the process. So the very process of attainment is that growing self-knowledge and an increasing of our consciousness, expanding, widening into the infinity. So all teaching is a revealing, all becoming is an unfolding. 
Self at me attainment is the secret. Self knowledge and increasing consciousness are the means and the process. The usual agency of this revealing is the word, capital W, word. The thing heard, Shruta. Shruta is a Sanskrit word. Shruti, Shruta, all that are related. Shruti is the word that is heard, I'm hearing. You know, the usual agency of this, this here is the awakening process. The usual agency of this revealing that what was concealed in the soul gets revealed and that's where the awakening happens. The usual agency of this revealing is the word, the thing heard. Very, very interesting line. If you look at your own journey, you will find that at one point or other, you came across some teachings. And how does the teachings reach you? Through some words. Now, these days, words come not only through hearing, but also through seeing, written word. But word finds its entry. And primarily the hearing word. We heard someone and words ring through. And word has a creative potency. And some words gently perch into the heart and begins to unfold. And that reveals the reason why we remember certain phrases, certain statements, because there is a truth inside that is corresponding to that word. Out of hundreds and hundreds of things we hear, we pick up some. That selection happens because we already have something within us which is resonating with that word and that word is only an agency that reveals that which is already hidden within us. Therefore, we remember that word, that phrase, that particular teaching because it is only pointing at what is already there within. And it, that, that's why the word is an agency, an external agency. So the usual agency of this revealing is the word, the thing heard, Shruta. The word may come up to us from within, it may come to us from without. Here again, two sources of the word. We can also hear the word from within. Within ourselves, there is a streaming of the words. Usually the mind is full of noise. But there are moments when there are quietness, there is quietness. Revelatory words come. And when that word reaches the mind, there is this aha moment. Wow, that makes complete sense. Often in meditations, this happens, where knowledge reveals itself as a word. That's a word from within. It's revealing what is already contained within. Same thing can happen. You hear some word and it awakens that which is already contained within. The word may come to us from within or it may come to us from without. But in either case, it is only an agency for setting the hidden knowledge to work. It is only an agency which is triggering, setting in motion the knowledge that is already contained within, that awakens. So there is a process of setting inner knowledge to work through the word. We are thinking and living beings. We are thinking being. Thought is using words. Word is the means of our thinking. And we receive the word from deep within ourselves. We can also receive word from outside. And that sets in motion the inner knowledge, the eternal Veda, secret in the heart within us is beginning to work. That's why some words really fall into our 
heart and we know, ah, there is truth in it. I can feel it. I can connect to it. Truth of the word resonates deep within the heart. But in either case, it is only an agency for setting the hidden knowledge to work. The word within may be the utterance of the inmost soul within us, which is always open to the divine. Or it may be the word of the secret universal teacher who is seated in the hearts of all. So here is again bringing these two pictures. One is this inmost soul within us who reveals through word. But even the word that is coming from outside, that is also coming from that inmost soul, the universal teacher, the secret universal teacher who is seated in the heart of all, behind everything, behind every thinking, living creature. The universal teacher is already present, omnipresent everywhere. And that teacher through one or other individual reveals a word and that word lands into your heart and sets in motion your own awakening. Or your own soul from within reveals a word and your mind wakes up to the word. It receives the word, trembles with the realization, trembles with a deep understanding, knowing that, yes, it is making sense. That's exactly how it unfolds. You just look back to your own journey. How did it begin? Some or other teaching resonating with you. And some thirst growing within the heart. And you start searching. The self-drive begins. And you seek knowledge and absorb knowledge like a sponge. Like a thirsty man who would drink the nectar of wisdom. And feeling that joy of discovering. All that is part of this beautiful journey. The word within may be the utterance of the inmost soul within us, which is always open to the divine. The soul within us is always open to the divine because it knows it is a portion of the divine. Or it may be the word of the secret and universal teacher. Universal teacher is also secret, hidden behind the veil of what appears to be an ignorant world, lost in confusion. Behind it, there is the universal teacher, secret, hidden, who is seated in the hearts of all. There are rare cases in which none other is needed. For all the rest of, yoga, of the yoga is an unfolding under that constant touch and guidance. <clears throat> the lotus of the knowledge discloses itself from within. The power of irradiating effulgence, which proceeds from the dweller in the lotus of the heart. There are rare cases in which none other is needed. Some people, that inner guidance or what they hear from outside, that is just enough for them. But such people are very, very rare. There are rare cases in which none other is needed for all the rest of the yoga is an unfolding under the constant touch and guidance. Constant touch and guidance coming from within. The lotus of knowledge of the knowledge discloses itself from within by the power of irradiating effulgence irradiating effulgence. As we travel inward and open more and more to the divine influence, what we recognize is it's an irradiating. There is a radiance. There is a revelatory ray of light that reveals in flashes. Awakening rays and irradiating effulgence. Initially, it starts like few little rays every now and then. Then increasingly, it becomes 
steady flow of revealing knowledge and eventually it become an irradiating effulgence it's like unfolding from within and that radiance will engulf and transform you so by the power of irradiating effulgence which proceeds from the dweller in the lotus of the heart our normal state is bound and limited as the awakening proceeds it gradually breaks the shell through all that shocks of life and as the shell cracks up then the irradiant effulgent wisdom emerges reveals continuously and transforms the outer nature that's how it unfolds there are rare cases in which none other is needed other than this inner guide for all the rest of the yoga is an unfolding under that constant touch and guidance the lotus of the knowledge discloses itself from within by the power of irradiating effulgence which proceeds from the dweller in the lotus of the heart great indeed but few are those to whom self knowledge from within is thus sufficient and who do not need to pass under the dominant influence of a written book or a living teacher so these rare souls who doesn't need any written book or any dominant influence of a teacher and they this people are able to find their deepest greatest truth by following the inner guidance these are really great souls but very very rare great indeed but few are those to whom self knowledge from within is thus sufficient these are exceptions very rare individuals who can do that and who do not need to pass under the dominant influence of a written book or a living teacher very exceptional beings do that when we look at life of sri ramana maharshi he had that awakening from within and he came to tiruvannamalai settled there discovered by going inward he was not depending on any dominant scripture or any particular dominant teacher the inner guide was all sufficient for him great indeed but a few are those to whom self knowledge from within is the the sufficient and those who do not need to pass under the dominant influence of a written book or a living teacher most of us would require a living teacher and a dominant influence of a book like i am engaging with synthesis of yoga that is my scripture that is transformed my life and this knowledge contained in this book coming from sri aurobindo even though i have not met him his influence through this book enters and it is through that my personal journey is unfolding but there are great souls who are exceptions who doesn't need any books who awaken from within spontaneously so great indeed but few are those to whom self knowledge from within is thus sufficient and who do not need to pass under the dominant influence of a written book or a living teacher vast majority of us we have a slow process and slow journey where we have dominant influence of books or a teacher or both together that's necessary for vast majority of us ordinarily the word from without representative of the divine is needed as an aid in the work of self unfolding and it may be either a word from the past or the more powerful word of the living guru so this is concerning those who <clears throat> would require the external support so ordinarily the word from without representative of the divine 
even that external world is also the representative of the divine is needed as an aid in the work of unfolding and it may be either a word from the past or more powerful word from the living guru there are many masters who are living currently their word is sufficient or the masters of the past their word whether it is coming from the past or the present a word which is representative of the divine that when it when it enters when our heart responds to it when the word is the agency through which the hidden knowledge awakens then our journey begins in some cases this representative word is only taken as a sort of excuse for the inner power to awaken and manifest it is as it were a concession of the omnipotent and omniscient divine to the generality of a law that governs nature so in some cases this representative word is only taken as a sort of excuse the word is really an excuse in some cases and here when they will give an example thus it is said in the upanishads of krishna son of devaki that he received a word of the rishi ghora and had the knowledge one word is enough to awaken some individuals most of us would go through reading book after book listening talks after talks words are falling in streams and gradually preparing our souls to awaken but there are souls who are ready and ripe and that individual requires just a word which is only an excuse for that sudden awakening to happen and the example of sri krishna is that rishi ghora it is was his word that became an agency for sri krishna to awaken and we can see it in sri aurobindo's life when he met vishnu baskar lele who asked him to sit and look into his mind and said you will see thoughts coming from outside you just reject the thoughts and you will discover the inner silence and that word was just an agency and she opened the sat with that and within 3 days he was able to enter into deep inner silence and experience of nirvana and that these are exceptions where word is just an agency that is setting in motion which is already ripe and ready to reveal itself so in some cases this representative word is only taken as a sort of excuse for the inner power to awaken and manifest it is as it were a concession of the omnipotent and omniscient divine there is divine presence in all who is omnipotent and omnipresent it is present everywhere and it has the power to override everything it's omnipotent to the generality of a law that governs nature the law that governs nature in nature there is this process of exchange through that the growth happens the growth unfolds so there is that which is concealed the great wisdom is concealed within an individual the divine is dwelling within the individual ready to reveal and yet would follow the process of nature let a word come from outside and let it land within this individual and the heart awakens and sets in motion the wisdom thus it is said in the upanishads of sri krishna son of devaki 
it's beautiful to see that Sri Krishna is referred to as the son of Devaki, that he received a word of the Rishi Kora and had the knowledge. So Ramakrishna, having attained by his own internal effort the central illumination, accepted several teachers in the different paths of yoga, but always showed in the manner and swiftness of his realization that his acceptance was a concession to the general rule by which effective knowledge must be received as by a disciple from a guru. In yogic tradition, that's how the great divine wisdom get transmitted from generation after generation, from master to the disciple. And in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, we see that a colossal capacity. First, he arrives at a central illumination, as Sri Aurobindo says here in this line. Central illumination. He realizes the deepest truth. Then he goes on to validate every path, every religion and its essential truth. In order to do that, he will go and accept a teacher. And that was a concession an excuse, generality of the law of nature, of receiving the knowledge from a guru to the disciple. Even though Sri Ramakrishna was illumined already from within, he would go as a disciple to another guru and tell him, please teach me of your path. And Sri Ramakrishna would rapidly go through the journey and realize the essential truth. And that rapidity with which Sri Ramakrishna was realizing within himself is a clear indication of the master soul who was giving this as an excuse going to a teacher, honoring the law of transmission. And he goes from one teacher to another teacher and receive. And this was excuse given by the master soul to the general rule of nature. So, Ramakrishna, having attained his own internal, by his own internal effort, the central illumination, accepted several teachers in the different paths of yoga, but always showed in the manner and swiftness of his realization that this acceptance was a concession to the general rule by which effective knowledge must be received as by a disciple from a Guru. But usually the representative influence occupies a much larger place in the life of the sadhaka. That's the usual case. Representative influence occupies a much larger place in the life of a sadhaka. Sadhaka is the practitioner of yoga. And representative influence, a guru who represents the divine and the influence of that guru will occupy a much larger space the normal life of a sadhaka. If the yoga is guided by a received written shastra, some word from the past which embodies the experience of former yogis, it may be practiced either by personal effort alone or with the aid of a guru. So you can receive directly from a teacher or from a Shastra directly. For example, Bhagavad Gita is such a science of yoga, a Shastra. You can receive it directly from the Gita and we can see that happening in Sri Aurobindo's life. When he was in the jail, he was doing the sadhana of the Gita and realizing Sri Krishna through that process, the divine through that process. You can receive directly from the Shastra or with the support of a Guru who has uh, practiced it and who can transmit it to you. So if the Yoga is guided by a received written Shastra, and what is the Shastra? It is some word from the past which embodies the experience of former Yogins. So the ancient scriptures, whether it is the Vedas, Upanishads, the Gita, Tantra, all these are embodied, encapsulated experiences of the former yogins. 
it may be practiced either by personal effort alone or with the aid of a guru. So we can take up any of the scripture, practice on our own or get the help from a guru. The spiritual knowledge is then gained through meditation on the truths that are taught and it is made living and conscious by the realization in the personal experience. The yoga proceeds by the results of prescribed methods taught in a scripture or a tradition and reinforced and illumined by the instructions of the master. So we take up scriptures and meditate on those lines, on the dhyana slokas, slokas of the scriptures, and that reveals deeper knowledge. And when there is a support from a guru, which makes it easier to unfold what is contained within a scripture. So the spiritual knowledge is then gained through meditation on the truths that are taught and is made living and conscious. One thing is conceptually understanding what the scriptures are saying. Other is to bring that into a lived experience, a conscious living experience. Made living and conscious by their realization in the personal experience. The yoga proceeds by the results of prescribed methods. So when there is a lineage, you will have a prescribed method to follow. Already well-tested, proven methods. Proceeds by results of prescribed methods taught in a scripture or a tradition and reinforced and illumined by the instructions of the master. So the master's own experience and illuminative guidance reinforces that understanding and accelerates the journey. This is a narrow practice, but safe and effective within its limits because it follows a well-beaten track to a long familiar goal. So Sri Aurobindo is saying, when following a well-laid path, it is still a narrow path. It's a narrow practice, but safe and effective within its limits. Every path has its limitation. As we have already seen in the overview of various paths Sri Aurobindo covered, each path has its possibility and limitation, particularly when it is well laid path, because it belongs to the past or the past conditions of humanity, past evolutionary stage of humanity. And that makes it, in a way, narrow for the contemporary applications. So this is a narrow practice, but safe and effective. It's very effective and relatively safe within its limits, because it follows a well-beaten track to a long familiar goal. Goal is already very familiar, and the path is already well laid. And thousands have walked the path and you can also walk. But it is to a realization that is already done in the past. Now, what would unfold in the future? This is where there is a difference. So this is a narrow practice. It is from that point of view. But safe and effective within its limits because it follows a well-beaten track to a long, familiar goal. So with that... We end today's episode. Please share with me your questions if you want me to elaborate anything else. And subscribe to this channel. Thank you. See you the next episode.